Um, so uh, today we're going to have a brief introduction to uh, uh, one of our common coastal management threats we haven't really talked about much so far, which is <clears throat> which is pollution. And so we use the example of, of plastics as an example, but it really applies to a whole bunch of stuff. Um, we'll also talk some more um, later on about uh, oil spills, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so let's talk about pollution. We haven't talked about this very much. And I want to um, put this in the context of general, our general thinking about pollutants and the, and the bad things about pollution. And so um, really the start of our understanding of modern pollution comes from the field of poisoning, from the field of toxicology. So this um, Middle Ages woodcut that I'm showing you here, we're looking and it's a, a royal court in Europe and these folks are all eating some food and there's a dude down front who's kneeling, right? And I've made the cup red. He's the taster, right? So that's sort of a joke or we make comic you know, skits about it, but that was a real thing. And yeah. it was a real thing because, because power was very limited in, uh, in the knightly and kingly courts and all these kinds of things. And so, um, so it was very hard to get to advance, right? So if you, if you wanted to have power, there's only one person that was power, usually a dude, right? And so if you were number two or three or four person in line, even if you were a dude, even if you had all these advantages and were born into this and that, you probably weren't going to be, you know, numero uno, right? And so that led to this huge wave in the Middle Ages, this huge development of a bunch of technology related to poisonings, related to killing people without them knowing that you killed them. And so that's why there's this taster here, because people started getting poisoned all the time. They're like, hey, have this, have this peasant uh, make sure everything is, is palatable before I uh, eat it. And so, um, so now, yeah, I'll just get that. Uh, so now, um, uh, let's talk about uh, the modern understanding of pollution. The modern understanding of pollution came from folks that took all that knowledge of poisoning, which is a very esoteric science, a very sort of secretive science. How do I give you a certain amount of lead that will kill you, but, but kill you slowly, right? That kind of thing. Um, and was first applied to us in, uh, in, modern, in our modern society in the late 1800s, early 1900s in New York City where people were starting to die. And so the police department there was trying to figure out why some people were dying. And they essentially went to a chemist and they went to um, folks that understood about poisoning and they started to do some, some quantitative analysis. And from that, we get this thing, which is the sort of key natural history part of most of our pollution and our worries about pollution. This is a so-called dose response curve or the so-called dose response theory of toxicology. Why do I have that natural history thing in, in my way? Hold on. Let me kill this. I don't know what's going on here. Let's kill that dude. All right, better. Okay. So, uh, so this is the, is the foundation of all of our, of everybody's worry about pollution. Everybody's worry about pollution. So the idea is this. The idea is on the x-axis is some measure of exposure to that pollution. If we're talking about the amount of stuff in air or water or soil or something like that or a volume, we usually talk about concentration, but it's the same thing, right? It's the amount of stuff going from low on the left-hand side of the figure to high on the right-hand side of the figure. <coughs> Excuse me. And then on the y-axis is some type of reaction that you would have or the fish would have or the dog would have or whatever. So that's the effect. That could be death, that could be sublethal, though. that could just be make you sick or, or change your behavior, that kind of stuff. And so it's going to go from low on the bottom of the axis to high on the top of it, right? Now there's, there's huge PhDs and indeed entire careers devoted to, <clears throat> devoted to um, trying to track this curve. And there's a couple basic categories of, of this curve, whether it sort of shoots up quickly or stays flat for a long time and shoots up at the end. It, and for the purposes of our discussion, that doesn't so much matter, right? The point is that at low exposure, there's low effect on the 
So over here, low, low. Over here, high, high. And if the effect that we're talking about is lethality, is death, that means there's some, some concentration over which uh, you're definitely going to die, or, or the vast majority of the population exposed will die. And it also means there's some level of concentration, there's some level of exposure down here that I could be exposed to, or we as a population could be exposed to, and we wouldn't, we wouldn't have any bad effects. There are some pollutants, some toxins, that actually we don't know of a safe level. We don't know of a safe level. So lead is one of those. Um, uh, but basically, most things fall out in here. Most things, you could have a little, a few molecules in you, and it's not going to mess you up. Um, uh, but pretty much everything is toxic at some level. The, the, the absurdest example is people say water, right? If we're in a room with a little bit of water, we're fine. But if we're in a submerged in a pool, we're going to drown pretty quickly, right? So there's, there's some level of absurdity here. But, um, but this is the key thing. And so most of the work, most of the research that we have built up um, over all these decades, over the last hundred odd years, is built around this, is built around people like you or me trying to figure out the shape of this curve. So therefore we could say, aha, this is a safe level of this pollutant, right? <clears throat> if we have this in the water, it's not, maybe not great, but it's not going to cause any bad effects or, or, or we'll rarely cause a bad effect. Versus if we're above a certain concentration or above a certain exposure of this material, it's going to be bad or it's going to be consistently bad or it's going to be bad for a wide swath of our critters or people or whatever. <clears throat> I should say the traditional field of toxicology is about human beings. Um, and so to, because we haven't really focused historically on natural systems and uh, critters other than people, we oftentimes will use the term ecotoxicology when we're referring to studies that specifically are looking at the effects on non-human endpoints. Um, but really, ecotoxicology is, is but a subset of overall toxicology, but it's traditionally when we say toxicology, most people assume we're talking about um, problems with people or, or problems to people. Okay. So the problem that we run into, okay, yeah, and so, and so as you know, we did, now we didn't serve this, we didn't survey, um, this was not one of our questions this year, but as we've talked about before, you know, several weeks ago, um, this is a very common, we used to do this all the time, and it just, it, because it never changed from year to year, it just, it became, it didn't seem important to keep doing it. But basically, pollution is always ranked as, if you recall, as people's number one fear, or number one th thought that that's the biggest management challenge, that, oh my God, pollution is bad, pollution is bad, pollution is bad. And we tend to de-emphasize things like habitat fragmentation, over-harvesting, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> One uh, type of plastic that we are um, obviously, um, what type of plastic? One type of pollution that we're engaged with now is, and it's not just you and I, but the wider society is increasingly trying to grapple with this um, let's see if this guy plays. It may not play. I think they deleted the video from YouTube. Let's see if it works. Yeah. So they deleted the video, but that's okay. Um, uh, anyway, th this, is, this is a, a video we, we, um, that was from the 1950s, basically talking about how great plastics are, right? And, and there's... They're, they're, um, the, the signature thing of our society, and they're super great, and they're all this and that. So here is a quote um, from uh, about a decade before that little cartoon there was made. Um, and this is talking about the, as with many of the things, many of our technologies that we bring to the fore, it's always great, right? Right now we hear this with AI. It's going to be great. It's going to make your life so good. It's going to help you get your tasks done. Right? We always talk up the potential upsides of the invention or the innovation, and only later do we, as a species, generally speaking, come to the potential downsides of that thing. So here's a quote um, from 1945. Um, it's a, this is talking about the, this new world where we have lots of plastics. It is a world free from moth and rust and full of color, a world largely built up of synthetic materials made from the most universally distributed substances, uh, a world in which nations are more and more in independent 
of localized natural, naturalized resources, a world in which man, because of course we want to talk about man, uh, like a magician, makes what he wants for almost every need out of what is beneath and around him. So, oh my God, hallelujah. <clears throat> um, but uh, uh, 50 odd years later, 60 odd years later, um, here's another quote. The durability of plastics and their potential for diverse applications, including widespread use of, as disposable items, were anticipated, but the problems associated with waste management and plastic debris were not. In fact, the predictions were how much brighter and cleaner it would be uh, than that which preceded this so-called plastic age. And so, um, you know, the problem we have is, is this, right? The problem we have is this material is everywhere, as we know. In, it's in landfills. It's all around our, in our natural landscapes. Um, and it's, you know, on our beaches. Even in places like this that appear to be free from this particular type of pollutant that we're talking about, this area is full of all this stuff. And so this is one of the modern, uh, this is um, uh, Norris, this is one of the modern uh, fathers of uh, all this theory. <clears throat> the first level of insight was um, understanding how, how many Gesundheit types of problems things um, uh, could cause. So um, not just to people, but to coral and to shrimps and all this and that. One of the, the classic uh, uh, understandings of environmental exposure to pollution, to toxins, um, came from uh, uh, Minam uh, Minamata Bay in Japan. And so you see this um, woman over there on the left, and she's cradling her son, and he's, um, he can't really bathe himself. And this was mercury poisoning. So this was mercury dumped into a coastal embayment and then built up in the fish and caused problems. So we've, we've learned a lot over the, over the decades, right? So for example, things like mercury have a methylated form that are, um, uh, particularly, can be particularly sequestered in biological tissues. Other substances, not so much. So we've really made a lot of progress on understanding this stuff. Um, I should say, um, yeah, do I want to say this here or next? Um, I'll, I'll save it for a bit. Okay, so, so uh, actually, no, I'll say it now. Okay, so, so this has governed everybody's thinking. This still, unfortunately, governs the thinking of most of our regulators. Um, and this is... Uh, only part of the story. So this totally works out for mercury exposure, predicting uh, what's going on with mercury, or, uh, or um, lead, or something like that, right? Um, but one of the big, so somebody tell, me, somebody tell me the story of DDT, anybody? And there's like a couple sentences, go for it. There's a chemical company in LA, down in the South Bay. Right, right. Uh, uh, Montrose. Montrose. Mm -hmm. um, and in, I think, like, late 60s, 70s, uh, they dumped gallons of DDT out in front of San Pedro, and they got caught. And the state sued them and got a lot of money, and that money's been used to do a lot of the restoration projects out on the island. Okay, generally correct, although mostly it's coming, it came from them washing, just washing down their equipment. So they did dump stuff, too, but... But it was mostly not people intentionally dumping stuff. It was just like, hey, you got to clean up, the, clean up yeah. the, the slicer or whatever, right? Um, what about, what's the, tell me about the ecological impact of DDT. Anybody? Izzy. Well, originally it wasn't used to help, like, decrease the spread of malaria and stuff like that. And right. Total. Right. But then as they started spreading it everywhere, they realized it had effects on, like, right. birds. Right, right. So DDT was this great um, insecticide, right, that really seemed to knock down insect populations. Uh, before this, we sprayed oil straight up in the wetlands. We just covered our wetlands in oil. Because that oil would form, um, so uh, mostly we were worried about vector-borne diseases, insects, um, mosquitoes spreading um, yellow fever and things like that. And the larval insects, when they're in a liquid, when they're developing, 
their, essentially their butt is hanging down and their head is poked up and they use the surface tension of the water to create a little hole, basically, and to breathe when, they're, when the rest of their body is underwater. And a, real, a fantastic evolutionary adaptation, really, really cool. Um, and so people figured out pretty early that if you spray oil on the surface of the water, it changes the, the, the surface tension and then essentially these little insects uh, can't hold open a hole in the surface of the water and they, they suffocate, right? But that meant we're spraying oil over everywhere. We're spraying oil everywhere or we were draining ditch, we were, we were draining um, or cutting ditches so that those wetlands would drain and not be wet, right? Bad things. So the idea of DDT wasn't meant to be an a-hole thing. It was, it was a, a, a better thing, right? We won't be screwing with the wetlands as much. We won't be having, you know, da, da, da. people won't be, have as many diseases, all that kind of stuff. Worked really well. And in the 20s and 30s, you see like, there's, you know, classic pictures of kids being smoked, right? The DDT truck's coming down the street, everybody run out. Hey, I'm gonna go hang out in the DDT smoke, right? And, and it appeared to really only affect insects. Right? It, it, it didn't appear to hurt you, your dog, the parakeet, that kind of stuff, right? And then, as, as Izzy was, was rightly saying, um, uh, so that happened. And then, after a few decades, we started noticing other consequences. And famously, Rachel Carson is the one that really sounded the alarm most publicly about this, so there, and particularly in her book, Silent Spring, which was very popular, very widely read, and, and really set off a, a lot of, and helped kickstart a lot of the modern environmental movement. But that's only this part of the story. And that's the straightforward part, right? I give you DDT and it kills, or I give you, 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 you insect population, I expose you to DDT and it's really toxic and you, you die, right? Okay, cool. <laughs> Uh, and then, as we were talking about there, we also had uh, DDT exposure uh, across the environment. The largest producer of DDT was here in California, was here, uh, in the world, was here in, in um, Southern California, Los Angeles. And uh, when we eventually moved to start banning DDT in the early 70s, we banned it, but we still made it. We still shipped it around the country, and, 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 around, the country around the world, right? And it was only, uh, you know, years after that that we stopped producing it entirely. Um, and so, so basically, we stopped using all this stuff. And everybody's been thinking of this. So everybody's thinking of this curve, right? So hey, the concentration of DDTs, I mean, yes, there's some, there's some important subtitle um, waste sites and things like that, and, and et cetera. But by and large, right here, hey man, you know, we're going to the left on this curve, right? We're going down on this curve. So we should be cool, right? <laughs> yeah, that yes, there's, there's some of this po pollution out there in our coastal environment, but it's not, you know, it's not like it was in the, whatever, 30s or 40s or 50s, right? Well, uh, the first signal for this were, um, uh, and this wa wasn't really appreciated till the early 80s, and it didn't really, really be appreciated till the late 80s, early 90s, in a, in a broad scale way we started noticing weird problems in especially our coastal populations. So in particular, um, uh, gull populations. And we started noticing failed reproduction in our gull colonies and, and things of that nature. Couldn't really understand why, it wasn't making sense. Turns out many of our seabirds, like uh, seagulls, um, are not sexually dimorphic. Right? So the males look about the same as the females. Right? If you looked at them, well, it's not that the males are bigger or different plumage. They, they look you know, pretty similar. And so uh, fo folks like uh, what used to be called Point Reyes Bird Observatory, where um, uh, Russ used to work, uh, and, and these other people, you know, bird nerds that study all these things, um, they were trying to figure out what was going on. And they said, I don't get it because we have these um, nesting pairs that are on these nests and, you know, say offshore islands and rookeries and things of that nature. So we have these birds here. So the birds are healthy. The birds are eating. Birds are here. But um, uh, they're, they're, they're not making any chicks. Like, what's going on? They can't figure it out. Can't figure it out. Eventually, um, they start to do some um, necropsies and they find some dead birds. And what we find is we find that what we thought were, uh, was a nest with a male and a female on it 
were, were increasingly female-female nests. And so um, now birds are, are, it's hard to fly. So there's a very strong selective pressure to um, uh, uh, have, um, you know, as lightweight as possible. So bird, so classically, uh, bird bones are really hollow, right? They're very light as compared to something like a, a cat or a dog or something like that. Also, uh, birds uh, oftentimes will have only one um, gonad, right? So an ovary or a testicle as opposed to two. And that uh, one is usually in the middle of their bodies. It helps them balance, right? And so what we started finding in these lesbian gold colonies in the 70s was um, uh, a female, but it would have two ovaries. Or, it would, or when they do a dissection, they'd find a testicle and an ovary, right? Super, super, I mean, I suppose that happened in the past, but very, very strange, very strange. <laughs> and after a bunch of work throughout the 80s, what we figured out was it was DDT. It was actually DDE, is some of the, the uh, daughter products of DDT after they get inside a vertebrate body. But essentially what was going on was we'd, we'd had all this DDT, right? And it was causing the eggshell thinning and the cr crushing of the populations of seabirds and things like that that Rachel Carson was writing about in the 60s. That totally happened according to this, according to this dose response curve, right? And DDT was messing with the protein in the egg, in the sort of how the bird lays down the eggshell and was making it very, very thin. In fact, one of the ways we've, we documented this was with the Western Museum of Vertebrate Zoology down the street right here. And the world's largest collection of nests and uh, now the largest collection of nests and bird eggs. Um, because we had these historic bird eggs from the 20s that you could actually go back and measure the thickness of those shells and actually see that as we spray DDT or in, when DDT came into an area, the eggshells, you know, in the subsequent years started getting thinner and thinner. So when we banned DDT, the eggshells started to get thick again. So that's great. So we start, so, so moms wouldn't crush their babies when they were sitting on the nest. So that's good. And so that's following this dose response curve here, the traditional toxicology approach. But that DDT is one of those classes of, of pollutants that sticks to our fat. Okay, that, 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 that gets sequestered and, and hides in, in um, uh, fatty acids and things like that, right? So in our fat deposits. And um, it turns out, and also I should say, this is very, very, so our machine in there, super high tech, right? Very, very precise. That machine didn't exist our FTIR didn't exist, uh, at least in the form it's in right there, didn't exist a decade ago, right? Similarly, we, our, our fantastic chemistry and engineering uh, colleagues are constantly inventing really cool new ways to assess stuff. We didn't have the ability to measure many compounds at very low concentrations in the 60s, in the 70s, or in the early 80s. So we couldn't, so these researchers that were looking at these lesbian gold colonies and these other things, they couldn't figure out what was going on, right? They did their regular suite of chemical tests, you know, the re reg regular assay for different coastal pollutants, and we couldn't, I was like, I don't know what's going on, I can't find anything. By the late 80s, we start to get the ability to get much um, higher resolution chemical analysis. And by this, I mean parts per million, or in some cases, parts per billion. This is insane. These are, these are, you know, a little eye drop, you know, half an eyedropper of stuff in a, in a swim, in an Olympic sized swimming pool. You know, this is, this is very, very low concentrations. And what we find is what was going on was that DDT has this long tail, has a long legacy. So we got through the first wave of the pollution, but the second wave was hanging out. And it turns out with DDE, with, with the breakdown product of DDT acts is, it doesn't act like this. It doesn't act like a foreign body. It acts like you. And your body, it exactly mimics you. So as you're developing, when you're, when you're a little you know, uh, embryo, you know, getting bigger and bigger, you're doing all kinds of stuff. You're growing a nose, and you're growing a heart, and you're, you know, all, these, all these different um, massive orchestra, incredible evolutionary orchestra that's going on, right? 
And so your hormones are, are triggering different tissues to grow in a certain way at a certain time, right? We don't want to have a, we can't grow a, um, I don't know what we grow. We, keep, we, we can't grow a fingernail, you know, on day one, right? That doesn't make sense, right? We kind of, we need to go in a certain order to get, um, to, to, to properly develop. And so it turns out DDE mimics estrogen. And so we also refer to this type of pollution event now as environmental estrogens. And so what was going on was completely different from this historic view of pollution. So it's really important you guys understand this. This is a very, it's a, it's a complete different category of understanding pollution. And most of our laws have not caught up with this. Most of our laws do not understand this. Okay, so the idea here is, okay, lead, you're bad. How do I know you're bad? Because you and I spent, you know, four years doing a bunch of experiments and we, and we looked and we took some model organism and we exposed that tadpole or that, that plant or whatever to, to the copper or the lead at concentration one and we looked at what happened. In concentration two, and we looked at what happened. In concentration three, right? So we, we did that and then we made, made our curve here and we went to our regulators and said, hey, you guys, above concentration X, that's bad. So we shouldn't let the pollution ever get above level whatever the heck, right? But now what we have going on is a substance that could be in parts per billion. And um, I can take that and I can take my developing, let's say, rabbit embryo or, or fish, fish embryo, right? And I can take my, uh, my uh, DDE and at whatever concentration you were doing experiments, so let's say like one part per billion or whatever the heck it is, right? And we could take baby, our group of baby rabbits and put one part per billion in the, in the uh, dish with the, with the embryo and let it go. And then, you know, wait a couple months and check it out. Oh, we got healthy rabbits. Okay, cool. We can then take that concentration, double it, just like we're doing here, right? Double it on day, you know, seven that we're exposing it and see no effect. Triple it, quadruple it, 10 times it, 100 times it, no effect, right? So according to the old rules, ah, DDE is fine. But what we figured out was, okay, so we do that whole thing we just did, one part per billion at day 14, no effect. But then we need to do it at day 15, no effect. Then we do it at day 16, no effect. Then we do it at day 17, massive effects, massive effects. Um, com completely changes the rabbit, right? Changes the rate at which the rabbit develops, uh, the rate at which rabbit develops cancer, the at, rate at which uh, rabbit uh, reaches sexual maturity, like all these things. Day 18, no effect. Day 19 embryos, no effect. Tw so it's not just the concentration as historic toxicology tells us, it's the timing of it as well. And so, so this is really hard because to do this experiment is hard with lead, right? But if you and I got a bunch of money, we could do it. But to do all the possible combinations plus all the possible, you know, timing, that is exponentially, it's, it's fantastically difficult to do. <laughs> Question. Was that like, put, it was consecutive days and then just like on... on no, no, it's exposed just for one day. So exposed day 14 and then put it in clean liquid. And, and then day 15, get another group of rabbits that, we ha that are 15 days old. Right. Expose that second group to that concentration at day 15, and then wash them and put them in clean stuff on day 16. So we're talking about just a, a point in time exposure. Okay. Okay. So, um, so that's a challenge. That's a challenge, right? And so, um, so, this, so now we understand that there's both gross concentration of a pollution in our coastal environment that could be bad, but also it could be when you're exposed. And so in general, in general, critters that are the smallest, that are developmentally the youngest, those are the most vulnerable to pollution of any type. So the, the sperm and egg are really vulnerable to pollution, right? Then when we have, um, you know, 
a, a, a fertilization event that that blasts cysts and whatever. Yeah, that that's really really that, that that's the next level of sensitivity. And then as the individual gro grows and turns turns into a larva, that is. Uh, is is um, you know at every stage they get a little bit better at dealing with pollution, on average. And then by the time you get to uh, you know born and and sub adult, those folks are, are are better. And then by the time you get to adult, you're better, etc. So so you, generally speaking, the youngest life history stage is the most vulnerable. They have the least behavioral mechanisms to deal with pollution to, to like, get away from the something the water tastes bad or something, right? But they also have the, the least sophisticated um, uh, physiological tools to deal with that pollution that they get exposed to. And then what this stuff is showing us is that not only uh, is that going on, but as we've historically thought about it, fighting pollution, the pollution itself with these environmental these, these categories of environmental estrogens, actually the pollution starts to control how we, how our physiology works. And so that's a, a whole, uh, another crazy category. In general, when we talk about, um, and, it's why, and so the reason why plastics are interesting, plastics cover every single type of badness that comes from pollution except for radiation. So they don't, they're not, they're not, um, they're not a, a good example of, of, of radioactive impacts. But everything else, smothering, right? That big bag covers the mouth of the bird or whatever, or the, or the, the six-pack ring goes around the seal's neck or something like that, right? So the physical act of smothering for macroscopic stuff. And as we get smaller and smaller, um, these plastics hit all of these things. So it's both just the gross concentration of stuff that's bad, as well as the um, it, 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 it's super low concentrations. It can have estrogenetic effects, a lot of these plastics. So we see the whole range of stuff going on here. When we talk about pollution in general, we want to talk about the magnitude, so, so how much of it exists at any one particular place, right? The quantity. The ubiquity, which is, um, you know, is it everywhere or is it, just in, is it just in the bays or is it, you know, is it all over the place? So how much is there? Where is it? And then the range of impact. So then what might this pollutant do to our, our coastal communities or our, our, our marine organisms or, or whatever? Um, uh, there's, there's a new report that just came out uh, a couple a uh, week or so ago that I've not incorporated into this yet, but suffice it to say, this is the big picture. This is the big picture with, the, with this example of pollution, which we're talking about, which is plastic, right? So uh, the short version is um, the system is designed to pollute. So the narrative that we often hear is, oh, we're getting, we have pollution because something broke down, right? The system didn't work. The recycling didn't work. It blew out of the garbage can or something, right? No. The system is not designed to, to be unleaky, right? The, the system is designed to just produce a bunch of crap and not care about what happens with the crap afterwards. And so, so the numbers here aren't super important. What's more important is the relative size. So just stare at this figure for a second. This is the important story. So this is... Um, so plastics really get going. So our first, our first Bakelite, our first real industrial plastic is around the turn of the 1900s. It's used on a few things, but not very much. Uh, basically, it was uh, the lead up to and then during World War II that plastics really, the, the chemistry of plastics really goes crazy and we start to invent all these other forms of plastic. Um, Bit, primarily based on natural gas. We can use oil. You can make plastic out of natural uh, uh, polymers as well. But basically, basically the vast, vast majority we're talking about is, is stuff that derives from petroleum. And so, so that petroleum chemistry really goes crazy before World War II, during World War II, and in the wake of World War II, now we've invented all these crazy new ways to make plastics, and now the world is by and large at peace, and so we turn all that military design technology over to civilian use. And so really the modern era of plastics really gets going post-World War II at, at, at scale, post-World War II. And so the thickness of the arrows is what matters here, right? So have a look at the thickness of these arrows. And so um, we produce a ton of stuff, right? The vast majority of that stuff that we produce is just thrown away, right? 
starting in the 1950s, we really get, hit the, get this idea by design of the plastic industry that, hey, if we make this stuff cheap enough, we can make it disposable and then we'll hook everybody on this stuff. And they won't want to do paper bags and they won't want to do this and that. And they'll want to, they, they'll, it'll just be, it'll be great. Um, and so no thought to the environmental impacts, no thought to the, what happens after the consumer purchases the, the cheap plastic. And so most of that stuff is discarded. There's a little teeny microscopic, tiny, tiny, tiny fraction that is recycled. And that's where all the rhetoric that comes from. If you watch football now, if you watch any, any reality television, watch any news, you're going to see in the last couple of weeks a bunch of, a bunch of um, ads from essentially the oil and gas industry, American Chemistry Council, um, that basically say, hey, plastics are great, plastics are cool, and you know what we need to do? We need to do a better job at recycling. That is complete BS. So as an objective scientist, that ain't going to happen. That, that's, that hasn't happened so far, and we don't have the possible capacity. So right now, if we looked at all of our recycling facilities, say in the US, and if they were all working, and they were all 100% perfect, they would get something like uh, a fraction of a percent. They would be able to process something like a fraction of a percent of all the plastics we produce. So the, an the, no the notion of all we need to do is just, hey, you know, put it onto you, you guys need to do a better job of putting it in bin X or bin Y. That's not true. The system, this is the system that's designed. The system is designed to be leaky. Um, don't they have tech now that they can like decompress a lot of clean plastic that like, you know, are household things and then like melt it down and then repurpose it? I just don't understand how we're so poor so most most never goes in the blue can. This I, this is plastic. I know, I know, but I just don't get like why we're still so. So this is plastic. So there's about four levels right here that you're looking at. You, you look at it and you say, oh, this is paper because it's got cardboard inside. No, no. all these levels of stuff on top of it. Um, what else? This paper. Right? We want to print on paper because paper is like, ah, oh, cool paper. This stuff that's covering this is plastic. The stuff that makes it shiny in this ink is not all, but a lot of it's plastic. Um, that that uh, snorkel on the back of the lab, the, the, the gray stuff is, is uh, metal, but it's covered with plastic, right? The joints are plastic. So the, no so the theory that's put out there is if I take a this, okay, so, so okay, well, let's take this example. So this is an aluminum can, right? But if you look at it, it's like, oh, it's got this cool color. This color is plastic that's on it. Inside the can are three or four layers of plastic because we don't want the carbonated material to be touching the, the metal aluminum. So we put a plastic layer inside there that, create, that sort of has an oxidizing barrier, basically. But nevertheless, we're, we're, the theory, the, the, we're used to saying, hey, I'll take this aluminum and I'll send it to the recycler and that, that person will heat it up a lot, remelt it. Um, and so, you know, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. But, um, but this is just a couple examples here, right? Yeah. And so the notion is um, I do all this for free and then you do all the work to recycle it, right? Yeah. So, so that's not designed to be recycled. My, this computer, my computer is full of all kinds, similar kind of stuff, right? No, it's the, like, we're fucked. We're going to be known as, like, we killed ourselves based on the invention of plastic. So there are, there are other ways to do stuff, right? But, but, the, but what I'm trying to say is, what I'm trying to say is simply the rhetoric, which is, oh, we, you just need to do a better job recycling. We need to label the bottles better. That is a massive red herring, right? That is a massive, that's not to say that you shouldn't, I want you to throw your plastics anywhere. But it, it, that, that's the reality, right? The reality is the system is, these materials are not like metal or silicon oxide. They're not like glass, that we can simply take them, heat them up, and then turn that glass that's broken into new glass jars. It's not like that. The chemistry is different. And indeed, to do all the stuff that we ask plastic to do, let's say this bottle here is, I, I could, Right? I can squeeze it and it pops back to shape. So that's a, that's a desired thing. 
This is one type of plastic. This plastic here of the lid is designed to be stronger and, and gives a little bit, but not as much. I mean, this is fantastic engineering. This is decades and decades of people figuring out how do I make this, or maybe it's hotness. How does this stuff stay strong when it's hot? Or how does it stay strong when it's cold? Or how do when I push on it, this, you know, compress it? All these things are designed. And as we design that stuff, as we add in these incredible compounds, I mean, it really is amazing technology, right? To do this, every single thing we do makes it farther and farther from a piece of metal or farther and farther from a piece of glass. And so it works great for the moments that we're, we're touching the thing or, 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 or interacting with it as it's designed, but the rest of the lifespan, it's, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to, um, to, to, to write, right, right. Ben? Um, so we know the system is the problem, mm -hmm. not the recycle part of it. But what is there to do about that? Is there, because I get like, sure. recycle, recycle, recycle. Sure. So, so the question is, how do we, so how do we, okay, so that, this is where we are. How do we deal with this pollution, right? Yeah. We have laws, right? So we have laws about discharge and things of that nature. Discharge stuff in the air, discharge stuff in the water, controlled substances, this and that. So we do know how to deal with this stuff. In fact, um, it appears to be one of the, well, it's a little bit equivocal, but, but the suggestion is um, by passing a law, uh, the, the, the Convention on the Law of the Sea about dumping in the, in the late 80s, meaning cruise ships used to take all their garbage and just throw them off the boat, right, into the ocean. Yeah. And not just cruise ships, everybody. Yeah. Tanker, it just, it was, right, was how people did it. Um, so we passed a law that said you can't do that anymore. You got to take your waste, either you have to incinerate it or you have to take it to a place in port when you get to wherever. And we saw a downtick in, in ocean plastics after that, right? So, so these laws can have an impact. So this notion that we're completely powerless is not true. But, but simply passing a law to say you can't have straws in your, the straws have to be out of paper, that's not a bad thing, but that don't get delusional in thinking that that in and of itself is gonna save us. So rather what we need is we need what's known as a circular economy. So rather what we need is, is yes, I, I, I drink my drink, and then instead of this thing when I'm done with it being seen as, a, as something that goes in the garbage can or something that goes to be discarded or landfilled or whatever the hell, right? Rather, this, is, this now becomes the substrate for some other part of the economy, right? And so, um, and so people are doing this, right? So you, you're mostly, most, most of the advances here have been made in Europe on this front so far. In the last five years, we've had three different bills in front of the California state legislature to, to start to push us towards a more circular economy, right? Um, I mean, a small example of that, it just happened in Europe. So a small example, this is my, is my iPhone. So my iPhone right here has a, whatever it's called, this lightning connection right now, right? If you have an Android, you're screwed, right? You can't, you can't, uh, you can't use my charger, right? Or micro USB or whatever the heck the case may be. So, um, start. So now, if you buy a new iPhone, they no longer have these these connector, uh, this type of connector. Rather, they have a USB-C connector. And so, the idea is all of our phones going in the future. Well, the charging port will be USB-C. That's a small little thing, right? But the idea is rather than just have everybody produce whatever the hell they want, have some guidelines, right? So the guidelines, and so one, that's gonna reduce the amount of stuff that we need. The next level is to be able to make things repairable, right? So, so that when, when this computer, whatever, the memory breaks or the battery goes whatever the heck, right? It doesn't mean throw the whole thing away. It means we can start to recycle. You heard from uh, uh, Greg with the metals company about, about, and they haven't done this yet, but they're working on the idea of how do we not sell someone these rare earth metals, but maybe we lease them to them, right? And so, so that's, that's part of the circular economy, right? So it's like, it's like we don't just sort of one and done go away, but it's like how do we conceptualize this stuff? There's also um, some famous examples of, and this is getting to sustainability stuff, but, but this, this is, um, there's some famous examples of um, 
uh, some fantastic uh, paint companies and clothing companies in Switzerland and elsewhere where they're like, hey, I want a red shirt. And they've, they were historically making their shirts red, however the hell they, you know, industrial dyes and all that kind of stuff. And um, they spent some time and they, re, they redesigned their dyeing process and they, they now still make red shirts, but they use, I forget what the, I don't remember all the numbers off the top of my head, but something like seven or eight different compounds as opposed to the 32 that they used before. So that type of stuff. So there's, there's no silver bullet, but it's rather as we start to build this stuff into um, what's going on. Um, and so, so with that circular economy would come some standards, right? Would come some standards of, and that's, are, are we still gonna have plastics? Of course we're gonna have plastics. And, and, and is, there, is there value to plastics? I'm not saying plastics are evil, right? Having my medicine in a plastic container in the back of the ambulance is probably a great idea, right? As opposed to a glass bottle. That's, that's a cool thing, right? So, so I'm not a Luddite saying this is horrible, we should never not have plastics. But what I'm saying is this massive, insane sea of stuff that we're drowning in simply for the sake of being dumbasses and not, consi not considering the full life cycle, this, that's not a smart way to go, right? At, it's, it's very clear that the oil and gas industry, as they see us beginning to decarbonize, it's very clear that they also see plastics as a, as a route to, at least for a, a fraction, it's not the same as a fuel consumption, but a fraction of the oil stuff still going on. So you also see this lobbying and creation of, of new plastics um, uh, manufacturing capabilities as sort of a a sort of long-term guarantee that their materials will, will need to be, uh, can be used. Um, so, I mean, that, that's a long conversation. We just had a UN conference on this to sort of talk about global policy and global guidance. But, um, but yeah, so, so let, me, let me get back to this to, to finish this off real quick. So, so I'd say that the plastics um, can be in this, this example of a, you know, kind of coastal pollutant can be everywhere, can be a big piece of thing like you guys have in front of you right now or whatever, but it can also be small. And um, what we first started to realize was, so in terms of, and so I would say, this is also where the re, how the research has gone in recent years, right? And we've done a lot of this, Dr. Horn has done a lot of this. Um, uh, so basically the first level of the research was how much is there, right? In any one particular place. Next is, is that stuff all over the place or is it only one place? And then lastly, what's it doing to us? Initially, we focused on the big things, but what's been happening in recent years is we've been getting better techniques like our microscope-based FTIR and these other tools that we can actually look at finer and finer sized particles of plastic. And it turns out that's where most of the toxicology is with this type of pollutant. Yes, the plastic bag can smother the bird and that's, uh, it could kill a bird. I, I'm not saying it can't. And that definitely happens. And in fact, almost all whale necropsies we do now. There's some amount of plastic in a whale's digestive system. But um, where we think most of the problems lie, just like I said, um, the general principle is the youngest of life history, the most sensitive they are to, the, to pollution in general. Generally speaking, the smaller the, the, the substance or the smaller the particle, the more possible problems we see. And so what we're looking at right here is a stain and so this is some muscle tissue, um, muscle like, you know, in the ocean muscle, not your arm muscle. Um, and so the muscle tissue is stained green with this particular thing. And then the, a small little microplastic is yellow. And so we've now, and then, so the next phase of this research is we started to find this plastic inside of critters. And now we know that, for example, we've seen plastics um, cross the blood brain barrier. We've, we've seen evidence of them changing behavior of organisms. And so, so we pretty much know now that these plastics can get in, when we ingest it, um, uh, either through breathing or through drinking or, or swimming in the water. Um, it's possible, if they're at high enough concentrations, for them to get into us and then from in, inside our mouths or lungs or breathing apparatus can, can um, pass through our membranes and get into our blood and, and those other tissues. Um, yeah, who you know, we don't care about this, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say these are very low concentrations. These are very low concentrations of these things, right? So we're seeing, um, uh, you know, effects level at the parts per billion um, things. Um, uh, 
what captures the public's attention is, I mean, sort of microplastics, but it's this stuff, right? It's the, it's the visceral things that we can see unaided that cause people problems. So you guys know about the uh, giant Pacific jar garbage patch. Um, and in fact, there's many garbage patches where this floating plastic gets concentrated by currents and, and, and water and wind movements um, uh, in various areas. And again, this is playing off of our basic general understanding of, of physical oceanography. And so we see these relatively uh, large concentrations at various spots. And there are many of these. There's a western one and an eastern one and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, um, microplastics, by definition, are, are, is plastic pollution that's less than five millimeters in any one maximum direction. Um, and there's various types of these things. So, and this speaks to our, this speaks to our issue. So we, we kind of, I think the public thinks of this. Public thinks of this, right? And oh my God, that's the, my t-shirt wrapper and that's my, my, my toothbrush and that kind of stuff, right? Which is definitely true, that's there. But just like we had the conversation there about um, uh, circular economy, um, these are micro spheres or micro beads. So these are pieces of plastic that are designed to be microplastics from the get-go. So we've technically banned those from most products in California, although you can still get them. Um, and so the idea here is that these things were in makeup, these things are in toothpastes, things where you needed abrasion or, 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 or it was useful to have a, 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 a consistent level of roughness type of thing. And so what we're looking at, this is a microscope uh, uh, image um, of these plastics that are, and so, so this guy, so these are all micro beads, but this guy is a perfect one, this guy's a perfect one. These guys here have split open. Like this guy's split, this one's cracked. But um, the point is, these, were, these small micro pollution items were crafted and are crafted every day around the world and shipped all around. Um, this is a rainbow runner from when I was in, when I was in grad school years ago. Uh, it's a pelagic fish. And so sliced open his belly, and this is all the plastic that was in his belly, and this is you know, 40 years ago, right? Sale of it. Sale of it. Yeah. But not well, or not countrywide. Uh, correct. Yeah. So, the, so the micro bead bans or microsphere bans. That's a, that's a California state law. So there's other cities or jurisdictions, yeah. but that's not a U, It's not a U.S. law. And that's why I said ban because you go order something from Amazon and they're not they're not going to check, right? It, yeah. And and again, these substances, many of these substances aren't well labeled, and so it's not like. In the inventory, it's not like Amazon's trying to violate the law or something, right? I mean, well, at least in this case. Um, so, so basically, um, it, it's just like you know, uh, I don't know what it would be, uh, makeup number fourteen, right? And so, it, it, so that's why I say it's like supposedly banned, but you can still, you can still get them. What kind of fumes are made when you burn plastic? So Jake's question is, what happens when we when we um, uh, hit, burn these guys? If you burn, so the general idea is burn them. What tends to work best is to burn them at very, 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 very high temperatures, um, which tends to convert most of the stuff to more carbon dioxide and stuff. Um, at more regular temperatures, let's say your backyard fire when you throw stuff in, all kinds of stuff come off. So all kinds of, and it depends on what the plastic is, but it could be volatile organics. Um, it could be some persistent organic pollution that got stuck on, pollutants that got stuck onto this, to the material. It's basically a whole variety of organic compounds. You should not be breathing that stuff. Yeah, but yeah. like if it's like made from petroleum, wouldn't it like that just makes me think that it's probably like effective, like as like fuel to burn. So, uh, so yeah, so so one of the solutions that people have proposed to dealing with a, a large scale plastic pollution is to in indeed use it as a you know collect it together and then and then incinerate it. Obviously, there's there's embodied energy and there. there, there's there's chemical bonds there. So. Um, uh, Sure, um, it's it's not as efficient as you as you'd think because because like everything else like we mentioned here it's not just so maybe if we took the PVC from the back of the lab there maybe if you had that PVC and just had PVC pipe 
and had this one type of stuff, we could maybe sort of work out a, a combustion process that would work, right? But, but again, most of the stuff is mixed. It's layers of this and layers of that and partly this, partly that. All these additives that we've added in to change the property of the plastic. So it's basically, so with plastic, there's basically the backbone, the polymer backbone. So pl a plastic is a polymer. It's a repeated, it's re repetition of a bunch of monomers. It's a repetition of the building blocks. And then, um, and then we add other stuff in for those properties. And so that other stuff is also going to be there when you, when you burn it. So would you say generally it's like more destructive to burn it or more destructive to not? Yeah, so the question is, should we burn, so we've done a big beach cleanup, or, or after a big hurricane comes in, we've cleaned up our town, should we burn the plastic, or should we throw it in a landfill? And that's, that's going to be location dependent, is the short answer. So the burning of it is going to make a lot of toxic stuff and make poison, right, to be frank. Um, burying it is going to have poison in the ground. And so like all these things, there, there's no optimal solution, right? Uh, well, I mean, I, mean, I mean, it's all trade-offs, right? As we've been talking about throughout the semester. Everything's trade-offs, 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 trade-offs. And so to say like, should we burn it or not? In some cases, we should totally burn it. In other cases, we probably shouldn't burn it. But, but it's, it's so area dependent, it, um, it, it's gonna depend. Ben. Do you think, this might be outrageous, but do you think that there would ever be because like we put plastic everywhere, we just throw it everywhere. Like if we get the technology to do it, to just send it into space, if we have to, do you think we would do that? No. Okay. No. No. It's it's the amount of pollution we create from those rockets going up is yeah. way more than the benefit we get. Uh, no, so what, he, so what he was talking about is, he's talking about, um, well, it's not, it doesn't show on this map, but, um, so what he's talking about is, is this liquid here, more fresh water coming off and screwing with this part of this circulation. But we're still going to have this, so this is still going to be going on. So maybe that plastic patch that maybe would here might shift over here. And so, so the big issue is not so much is there going to be a patch or not a patch? It's just where is it going to be located? And it's the fact that we're not bringing that warm water over to the British Isles that's the problem. Good. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, let's just, uh, good, good questions, good questions, but I can't remember what I was talking about. Um, uh, so, yeah, so uh, it doesn't matter. We can just finish this up. But suffice it to say, um, this is an example of some of the um, some, uh, surface water trials where um, th these are ship transects, right? So the blue color means not much, and the hotter color means higher concentration, more, a larger quantity of plastics. Um, and so this stuff is, uh, uh, you can see that um, where we're in the middle of these gyre areas, in the middle of these seawater um, concentrators, or surface water concentrators, that's where we have the highest concentration um, of uh, plastics, macro, micro, et cetera. Um, and in fact, we have, we have a group right now, we have a capstone group, wait, is anybody in this room? Do, doing our deep sea? Oh yeah, there we go, right, right. So we're also starting to look at this now with some deep sea samples as well. People have found this already down at the bottom of the deep sea, but we're trying to look at this in the, in, uh, um, in the Pacific and see what we can find in terms of our concentration of stuff there. Um, yeah, it, this is all good. Um, I, I'll say that uh, a little word about ubiquity. So this is, our, this is some of our own work that we did with Dr. Horn. This began as Dr. Horn's capstone thesis and then became what she worked on for her PhD. Um, but this is some data from several years ago now. But these are from various beaches here, right? So you guys will recognize most of these places. The, um, let's see, these ones that have the, the names right here, these are, uh, these are the Channel Islands, so Santa Rosa Island, Santa Cruz Island, but the rest of these are, the rest of these are, um, are uh, uh, beaches, mostly in Central and Southern California. 
And so uh, this is, uh, so we've never found a beach that is free of plastics. We've sampled beaches in Hawaii, Cook Islands, Guam, all over the planet, and every beach has some amount of microplastics. Even though you look at them and you'd say, oh my God, this is a beautiful, pristine beach. This is great. I don't see anything macroscopic. The plastics are everywhere. And so um, uh, I just say that to say that they're all over the place. Other, and then the critters are ingesting them. So they're they are a ubiquitous part of our coastal and marine <laughs> ecosystem now. Um, and will be for centuries, right? So the question, and, and so the question isn't, so that it's a wrong question to say we should clean up the beach, right? The damage has been done. The question is how do we minimize the impact going forward? How do we minimize the badness going forward? How do we not have additional crud go into the beaches or to our waterways or to our whatever the heck, right? And so um, one clue as to what's going on here is have a look at the yellow versus the red. So the yellow would be essentially a piece of a plastic, a piece of something that broke down and broke down and broke down. So this is a chunk of something that was bigger. The fibers are little mini ropes, little mini strands of, of braided plastic. And while we have um, particles and fibers just about everywhere, we have, on average, way more fibers than we do uh, particles. Uh, the, the big difference is when we get to the islands, the relative, fibers are always common, but the relative amount of fibers versus the relative amount of particles shifts. So, Every single beach we've ever sampled around the world that has, uh, that has on, on the mainland, on a, on a, on a you know, continent, has crap loads of fibers. And fibers make up the majority of what we're looking at. On every single offshore island, the beaches on every single offshore island around the world we've looked at, there's a much lower proportional contribution of fibers. And so what seems to be going on is we're seeing a signal of our commercial and, and societal goings on on the continent. And so where do we get fibers? We get fibers from my shirt that I'm wearing right here. Probably most of the shirts that most of us are wearing or our, or our underwear or our socks or whatever, right? And so when we take that material, so just me going like this, talking to you, because I use my hands so much, as you guys always seem to tell me, I use my hands a lot. As I do that rubbing, there's some, whoosh, there's some little, a small number to be sure, but nevertheless, some amount of abrasion just happened there when I move my hand. And then that stuff is out there and it's floating, right? Uh, and so then when it rains, that stuff that's in the air is going to get washed down onto the soil or from the soil into the storm drain, storm drain. Into the, so there's going to be some stuff getting to our waterways that way. But mostly it's going to come when I wash this. When I put this in my machine, in my washing machine, and it agitates it, and it, and it for an hour or half an hour or whatever it is at a time, it's going to rub, 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 rub. And then when the water is cleaned out of that chamber, it's going to flush out, and it's going to go down to our, into our sanitary waste system. Sanitary waste system is going to go to the sewage treatment plant. So a treatment plant is going to do a fantastic job at killing the bacteria, killing the viruses, taking out the large chunks of stuff that get stuck in the, in the waste stream, um, sanitizing it, UV lighting it, all that kind of stuff. It, they were never designed to deal with microplastics. And so when that water is discharged from the, the sewage treatment plant, it's got microplastics in it. And so what seems to be going on here is the reason why our continents, continental beaches, continental coastlines are enriched with fibers is because we shed a massive amount of fibers every minute of the day.